A two-hour boat ride off the coast of Colombia is an island, the most densely populated island on Earth. Santa Cruz del Islote consists of more than 1,200 people living on land the size of two soccer fields, making it four times as dense as Manhattan. On the island is a school that runs up to the 10th grade, two shops and one restaurant. There is no steady supply of water and a sole generator that only runs for five hours per day. There are no police, but there isn't much need for them as everyone on the island knows each other. 150 years ago, the island was primarily uninhabited and was sometimes used by local fishermen as a place to rest and take shelter during storms. Gradually, some fishermen came to build their homes here. These were the grandparents and great-grandparents of the current generation of residents. Despite the close living quarters, inhabitants on the island say they wouldn't give up their peaceful existence for anything, not even a little more room. Okonoshima Island is a short 12-minute ferry ride from Hiroshima region of Japan. While the sandy and palm-lined beaches are perfect for holiday makers, the island draws crowds for a different reason. Rabbits. Lots of them. And how they got there is a mystery. Between 1929 and 1945, the Japanese army secretly produced over 6,000 tons of poison gas on Okonoshima Island. Some believe the current rabbits are descendants of those brought to the island to test the gas, but the current director of the Poison Gas Museum insists these bunnies have nothing to do with those from the World War II era. So where did they come from? One theory? え、ここに最初に連れて来られたのは1971年に、え、地元で飼っていた、え、地元の小学校で飼っていたウサギが飼えなくなって、この無人島であった島に持って、8羽持ってきたというふうに言われています。So those rabbits were released and with no real predators, they bred like well, like rabbits. And yet another theory Either way, this new generation of feral rabbits has the run of the land, and they're creating a new story separate from the sordid past of Okonoshima Island. An island once known for death is now known for possibly the cutest thing ever. Bunnies. Just over 30 miles away from the Slovenian capital, this alpine lake looks like it belongs on the cover of a storybook. With a fairy tale cliffside castle, an emerald green freshwater lake, and views of some of the highest peaks of the Julian Alps, Lake Bled and its island church make a postcard perfect scene. To visit the Assumption of Mary Church, you must catch a ride on a wooden boat known as a plenta. Plentas have been taking visitors to the island in the middle of the lake for centuries. Once reaching the island, it's a 99 stone step climb to reach the entrance to the church. It is said that if a groom could carry his bride up these steps and ring the wishing bell at the top, the marriage would be a happy one. The church is most famous for this bell, which was made in the early 16th century and is said to be a gift from the Pope. Legend has it this was the church's second bell. The first was bought for the church by an inconsolable widow in honor of her late husband, who was murdered and then thrown into the lake. When boatmen brought it across to the church, an unexpected storm hit and the bell sunk to the bottom. 
It is said, if you listen closely in the dead of night, you can hear the sunken bell ringing from the depths of this picturesque lake. Coastal at one moment, isolated island at another, Mont Saint-Michel is incredibly stunning, no matter the tide. In between two powerful tides from Normandy and Brittany stands the Gothic-styled Benedictine Abbey, named after and dedicated to the Archangel Saint Michael. Mont Saint-Michel wasn't always an island. In prehistoric times, it stood on dry land. However, as sea levels rose, erosion reshaped the coast. Even today, it only sits 600 meters from land. Although it has less than 50 full-time residents, it is visited by more than 3 million people each year. The climb to see the Abbey isn't easy. It's around 900 steps. More than just a church on a rock, Mont Saint-Michel is a medieval time capsule and was one of the first monuments to be classed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site back in 1979. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Catherine, and this is my husband, Wayne. I'm Wayne, and welcome to Freedom Cove. We live in a secluded cove. The only options we have to get here is by water. There are no road accesses. The water is our highway. Everything that you see here in our home is floating. We are tied to shore with lines. We are not anchored. We have our main living house. We have the dance floor, the lighthouse building, four greenhouses. As I started to grow the garden and make it larger, then we had to have more space for that garden. Everything's done with a handsaw and hammer. No power tools. I know every board and nail by name. It's about 500 tons, a million pounds that I'm flowing. I've been building tree forts since I was seven. Yeah. And I said, well, Dad, I'm putting a tree fort in the ocean. Do you ever get seasick? No, but when I go out of town, I get land sick. Mm -hmm. The thing about living in Clackwood Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island is the richest biomass on Earth. So the opportunity to fish for dinner is and I just can get in my canoe and paddle out in 10 minutes, I can catch a fish. But when it's windy and too, too rough out there, I can just lay on the couch and fish out of the house. I was hoping to make a lot more money as an artist. So subsistence living was our only opportunity to have anything as artists. We could never buy real estate, so we had to make our own. It was a great opportunity to actually move away from the city to see if we could prosper out here. Now, 24 years later, we're still doing it. I can't imagine living any other way. I feel completely fulfilled. Oh, <laughs> that's good, huh? <laughs> that's really nice. I'm working on it. <laughs> In the southern part of Croatia, in the peninsula of Peljezak, there is a winemaker that does things a little differently. That's right, this winery ages their wine 75 feet beneath the sea's surface. After growing up around many traditional winemakers, Edie had an idea to combine his two favorite pastimes, scuba diving and drinking wine. So he decided to try an aged wine in the sea. My first idea was to put wine in a glass of wine and to put it in the sea. To avoid any leaks in these ancient storage jars, Edie uses a glass bottle to keep the wine in and salt water out. 
He uses custom-made cages that line the sea floor to hold the wine in place. Boca stoi obrnuto gornji dio, to jest čep stoji u odnosu na dno naprema dole. U rasponu od jedno i pet do dvije godine i niko to ne dira. Ali u biti inače se preveravaju svako petnestak dana se zaranja da se vidi što je i kako nastaje. Boravi na temperaturama koje su idealne za održavanje crnoga vina i što je najvažnija stvar naša, da boravi u tišini. Ova tišina je jedan od faktora s kojom mi želimo dati jednu notu prilikom kušenja vina. And to Edi, it's this silence that differentiates his unique underwater wine from the pack. Zato što u svim podrubima tokom godine se radi, vazda se odmiču neki predmeti, vazda se nešto radi, vazda se nešto odmiče, promiče. Tri ti zvukovi koji se događaju u podrubima sigurno utječu, jer to je jedan živ organizam, utječu na vino. Vino dobiva drugačiji i puniji okus nego što je vino u boci normalno pakirano. Ja mogu osjetiti razliku, a svakako ljudi koji su baš u tom biznisu, par poznati sumeljeri, sigurno će primjeriti jako veliku razliku.